I've lived a, a, a very challenged life. And, you know, I think one of the primary reasons why I'm still alive is because in moments, God has intervened on my behalf. Mm. The things that the world may have uh, conspired to happen to me, uh, God conspired to protect me from. And I think the one thing that I've struggled with the most is understanding why God didn't intervene on my son's behalf. Hello and welcome to At The Podium with me, Patrick Huey. At The Podium is a multimedia platform where story by story, we explore the resiliency of the human spirit with people who are using their own personal journeys to leave a positive and transformative imprint on our world today. At The Podium holds a space for meaningful conversation, inspiration, and life. Today, I'm thrilled to share the podium again with Quentin Venny, co-founder of The Equity Company. Quentin is a celebrated wellness expert, international speaker, and author of the best-selling memoir, Strong in the Broken Places. His work has been featured in the Huffington Post, Thrive Global, Entrepreneur, Fox News, and many others. Quentin has been recognized as one of Black Enterprise Magazine's 100 Modern Men of Distinction and by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention for his contribution in raising awareness for mental health and suicide prevention. He has served as the wellness keynote speaker for Colin Kaepernick's Know My Rights Camp in his hometown of Baltimore, Maryland, and continues his work with youth in under-resourced communities, helping them understand their traumas and turn them into triumphs. As a former nonprofit executive, he spearheaded initiatives that made yoga and mindfulness accessible among communities and populations that didn't ordinarily have access to them. Of equity, Venny says, equity exists to destigmatize mental health, expand pathways to wellness, and help make mental health-centered products more accessible and equitable. Quentin, welcome back to At The Podium. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a real pleasure to have you on. I have to say the last time that you were on, your episode touched a lot of people. I think they heard your story and what you overcame and what you went through. And it resonated for a lot of people who, were, who, who, have, who have found themselves, maybe not in those exact situations, but in that place where they had to be strong in the broken places. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, it's it's always a, a humbling and, and blessed experience when I can share my journey, my life, my trials, tribulations, but also my triumphs and be an inspiration for somebody else, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's one person or a hundred people, right? I've I've always, since I started sharing my story, my my mindset has always been if I can motivate and inspire one person every day to like not give up to stay on course you know to to stay focused and 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 find a space of their own resilience mm. uh, then my living is not in vain right and so i you know i started that mindset um during my early parts of recovery um and that's really just the 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 foundation that i live my life off of I love that, man. I love that. I read your book, Strong in the Broken Places. And then as we were going to talk again, I went back and did some just research on what people were saying about the book. And there was this really beautiful quote that I thought, this is a perfect way to start this conversation. And what was written was, it says, Strong in the Broken Places is the harrowing story of Venny's life, the detours that almost ended it, and the inspiring turns that saved it. The odds were stacked against him, but he was able to defy expectations and claw his way out on his own terms. He is living proof that during our weakest moments, we have the power 
and the ability to unlock unimaginable strength. And I thought about that in context of your life over the past two years. And, and I'm wondering how you had to dig deep into those reservoirs of unimaginable strength on April 12th, 2023. Yeah, it, you know, um, I think that was by far the, the worst day of my life, right? Um, and, and I think you and I talked about it a bit briefly in person. Um, but, you know, for, for those who are listening and, and, and potentially watching, like that was the day that, you know, my, uh, my oldest son um, passed away. And he passed away after accidentally uh, ingesting fentanyl. And I was the one that found his body. And when I found him, he was stiff, uh, which indicated that he had been he had been deceased for quite some time. And, you know, I think my faith in God has really been the what has kept me grounded throughout this process. My mm -hmm. faith, my family, you know, I mean, my wife still deserves to have a husband. You know, my other children still deserve to have a father and I still deserve to have a life um, beyond what I am on most days struggling to accept uh, and what I'm still grieving through. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that was really pivotal, this probably took place about eight or nine months before his passing. You know, during one of my therapy sessions, I've been in therapy for quite some time, you know, it was discovered that in spite of everything that I've experienced and gone through in my life, I've never grieved, you know, uh, I've, I've, I've never grieved the loss of family members. I've never grieved the loss of close friends. Um, and so grief was something that, you know, I was in therapy trying to understand and now in life i'm i'm in the process of of experiencing it right the how it can come to you uh, out of nowhere how a, a song a reference a, a weather uh, a smell mm. can all bring these these memories back and um you know cause the 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 grieving process to essentially start over you know, um, I've lived a, a, a very uh, challenged life. And, you know, I think one of the primary reasons why I'm still alive is because in moments, God has intervened on my behalf. Mm. The things that the world may have uh, conspired to happen to me, uh, God conspired to protect me from. And I think the one thing that I've struggled with the most is understanding why God didn't intervene on my son's behalf. Um, and I've I've questioned that from God. And the one thing that I have to make peace with is the is the possibility of me never knowing on this earth, right? Yeah. It, it's very similar to forgiveness, right? Like for me. Forgiveness is accepting the apology you may never receive, but doing it for yourself and not for the other person. And, and that's what, you know, my life has really been um, consisting of is, you know, accepting the reality that I will always have questions that may never be answered. But knowing that my son and whatever it was that he was experiencing is no longer in a space of suffering. Mm. And I have to find, though, though we may be struggling um, with the reality of his of his his passing, um, my son has ex has superseded the limitations of our human experience, and I have to, in some capacity, uh, find a level of acceptance in that. Yeah, it was one of my questions: was how do you even begin to think about 
forgiveness in this context because there has to be anger at so many different situations and people who you don't even know the people who made the pill that put the fentanyl in there like there must be so much just anger and rage and hurt i don't even know how one begins to even contemplate forgiveness you know i think it's a journey yeah it's it's definitely a journey uh it is it is not a destination whatsoever you know uh i had to first forgive myself and feeling as if I failed my son, even though I, I warned him and, and we were, we've had very, very extensive conversations about a lot of the things that he was engaging in. Um, you know, one of the things that I did not expect or think was that he was, you know, experimenting with any kind of pill, you know? Um, so for it to even have been a, a result you know, uh, or the catalyst to his passing, it was it was unbeknownst to me that you know um, that was even something that he was in, he was experimenting in, and I don't know if it was the first time, right? And I think a lot of you know a lot of people, especially teenagers who are in this this life cycle of invincibility, with this this idea of invincibility, they don't realize that it only takes one. You know, um, and just based on the evidence that was discovered, if this was not his very first, it was one of the first. And I don't believe that he was aware of of what he was, you know, um, getting himself in, involved in. So I first had to forgive myself. You know, then I had to forgive God. Mm. And and what's what's interesting about that process for me is that. I was always raised to never question God. I was always raised that we needed to ask God for forgiveness. But I needed to forgive God for not intervening on my son's behalf in the same way he in intervened in mine. And then I also had to forgive my son. Mm -hmm. And that's still something that I struggle with, you know, because I, I am still upset with him for not listening and not heeding the advice, not taking full advantage of the life that I worked so hard to provide for him and the, the situations and the circumstances that we sacrificed to ensure he had uh, a head start. Mm. Um, and so I think from a, and then to go a step further, right, is forgiving the individual who gave him the pill and, you know, forgiving this person and that person. And, and I think a lot of that has to, to be completely honest is, is a lot of the reason why I left Maryland. Yeah. You know, because in those moments I couldn't forgive. I needed to take a step away and I needed that step to be so far that there was no possibility of me running into or coming in contact with anybody that may have been involved. And, 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 and that was, that wasn't the first step of forgiveness. That was the first step of the first step of me showing grace, mm -hmm. to the individuals who contributed to his passing. You know, who sold him or gave him. I have, a, I, I, I have an inclination. It has not been proven. It has not been substantiated. Um, but, you know, I think the, the best thing that I could have done was to separate myself. You know, it's so interesting. I was having a conversation with a, a friend of mine who has daughters who are around Christian's age. They're, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old. And, you know, she she had a real straight conversation with them. She was like, listen, you know, back in the day, we, we smoked pot. You know, we maybe did some other stuff, but people weren't dropping dead from taking pills. And that you have to give your children who may not have the capacity to even understand what they're doing sometimes, that it's literally life or death. You can't play. And it's it's uh, the fact that you, people are having those kinds of conversations with their kids is unfathomable to me. Yeah, I mean, and I, I had to... I've had multiples yeah. with my son. And, you know, I, I think 
where we are in society and, and the, the challenges that we experience as parents are significantly different than what our parents dealt with when we were coming up. Yeah. Right. And I think I social media has way more influence than we can conceptualize. Um, and the way that socialization occurs in, you know, in society today and how that impacts the adolescent brain, how that impacts the behavior, um, how that feeds into this cloak of invincibility, we don't have enough research and studies to fully understand and comprehend how damaging this is. Yeah. Uh, and so we are seeing our children, um, it was stated years ago that our kids will be the first generation expected to not outlive their parents in the history of this country. And it was primarily due to obesity and diet. And now you add in all of these other issues, fentanyl, you know, prescription drug abuse, addiction, so on and so forth, suicide, cyberbullying. Yeah. You add all of these things up, you know, I am a living example that my son did not get an opportunity to outlive me. And, and so what was once a statistic that I warned people against has become a statistic that I now have to live as a reality. How did, how did you and your wife explain what happened to your other children? Uh, very carefully. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I've, I've always been very upfront. I'm, I'm, I don't come from the, I'm from Baltimore, right? I don't come from a world of beating around the bush and like, you know, uh, you know, telling you that it, that it's, it's sugar when it's actually not right. Yeah. Um, so we had to be a hundred percent, um, upfront, uh, but I also wanted to, in in to protect the integrity of my son and, 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 and protect the, the legacy that he left um to his siblings mm. and so we 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 had an honest conversation and it's been an ongoing conversation um but it's 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 really been very intentional um and uh and honest something you said to me when we spoke a few months ago that it stayed with me you said to me that the when the paramedics came to the house, that they said it was a good thing that you did not try to revive him because it would have killed you too. Yeah. And that, wow. Yeah, I think, I think for that, right? Like that was one of the hardest things for me to, to get past because You know, I, I think it was another example of of God intervening on my behalf. Yeah. Because my my parental instinct was to try to revive him. No matter the situation, right? Like I I, I did not accept that my son wasn't with us anymore mm. in that moment. So when I was on the phone with the paramedics and they were like, you know, uh, do you think you could, you would be open or willing to try to revive him or perform CPR? I was like, absolutely. And that was, that was a, a really, a real out of body experience for me because logically I knew he was no longer with us, but emotionally I couldn't accept it. And so hearing the paramedic even offer the possibility for revival gave me the inclination that or made me believe that what or even think for a moment what if my son is suffering and is praying that i can help him and the only thing that saved me from performing cpr was the fact that when i moved his body when i shifted his body I had to literally peel the pillow from his face because of how rigor mortis had set in. 
he was, you know, it, it, it was, it was beyond the shadow of a doubt. My son was gone. Yeah. That there was nothing in that moment that could have saved him. Had that not been the case, I probably would not be here because I would have attempted to revive him. And, um, and I would have been exposed to uh, fentanyl as well. And we all know that the smallest amount, the 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 size of a pin dot is enough to be fatal. Um, and so when, when my son consumed that pill, um, he didn't stand a chance. And as a result, I wouldn't have either. You write really poignantly about the first father's day without him you wrote about that it, it was it was heartbreaking and I, I wonder how what did you what did you do to get through that day you know I, I think for me I you know I've often had the conversation with my wife and 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 even with my kids and you know my mom that we're all in a new journey hmm. And a part of that new journey is them figuring out how to love the new version of me because I lost who I used to be on April 12th, right? I'll never be that person again. And so I allow myself to feel whatever it is that I feel from moment to moment, mm -hmm. you know, in a way that I, I, I never really did before. I've given myself permission to, to create a boundary even around what I am willing to invest emotionally, right? Yeah. I have family come to me and, and, and reach out and they'll want to have conversations and express their hurt and how they're feeling. And, and in some moments I can give them that and I can be that shoulder. And in other moments, I have to tell them, I can't go there with you right now. You're going to have to figure this one out. Right. And so, Father's Day, you know, um, it it wasn't a day of celebration for me. It was a day of reflection. And, and to be honest, it was really, it was a challenging day for me because it forced me to question who I am as a father and what I believe fatherhood stood for and represented. Mm -hmm. And it made me reflect that there may have been moments where I could have been softer. There could have been moments where I could have listened more intently, you know, uh, but then it also allowed me to reflect on the fact that I was blessed enough to have 17 years with my son, mm -hmm. you know, and there are a lot of people who can't say that. And though I wish I had more time, uh, I have to find gratitude in the time that I had. And, and that's really how I got through the day. And that's, and that's how I get through every day. Right. And in, in less than two months, it'll be a year since he's passed in January, January 6th of this, of this year, he would have been celebrating 18, hmm. you know, um, and everything that we had been planning when he was 16 up until his passing at 17, only three months after his birthday, after, after his 17th birthday, was really to prepare him for 2024. He wanted to move to Seattle. He wanted to like live on his own and, and do it in a place outside of Maryland. And, and we were planning and putting things in place the day that I found him, we actually had plans, you know? Um, and so, you know, I think Father's Day, the world views it as a, a day of celebration or relaxation for fathers. But as a father, every day is Father's Day. Yeah. You know, I go to the gym, uh, you know, and a buddy of mine, that, that's my boxing coach. I grew up with him. I'm actually like 10 years older than him. And, and every time he sees me, he says, happy Father's Day, King. You know, and it's like every day is Father's Day. Right. And so knowing that, like every day is also a challenge. Every day also presents its, you know, its fair share of difficulties. Every day, my grieving, it looks different. Um, and so, you know, that was just a day in the bucket uh, because I have to, it, it, you know, live this reality every day moving forward.
I think that's something that it's very interesting that you said is that every day your grief looks different. And I think, you know, there was a, a book or something about the seven stages of grief and people who go through these experiences say there's a hundred stages of grief, sometimes a hundred in a day. And I think that is really, how do you, how do you find your way through that when it's so changeable and what you're, what's moving through you about this is so changeable. How do you find center in that, in those times? Um, I think I find center by allowing myself permission and grace. You know, there's, there's, there hasn't been a week that's gone by that I haven't cried myself to sleep at least once every week, you know, thinking about my son and, and, and all of these things. And so, you know, I, I rely heavily on my, on my practices, right. On the things that, um, that keep me grounded, right. My, my daily cup of tea, you know, my breathing practice, exercise, you know, my supplements, you know, um, just wanting to be the best version of, of who I am for myself and the people around me every day for my kids, for my wife, for my business, uh, for my friends, for, for those that support me, for those that I support, um, for individuals like yourself and, and the platforms and conversations we're able to have, you know, and so I lean a lot on my faith, uh, knowing that everything happens for a purpose that we may not understand, we may not agree with, um, but we, you know, we can only control the things that we can control, right? And so on the days that I feel like I've had enough or I've had, I feel like it's been too much, I'll take a break. I'll take a step away. I'll take that time. On those days where I feel celebratory and I want to celebrate his life, you know, then that's what I do, you know, and I do it unapologetically because I, I, I'm a human being. I'm an unapologetic human being. I'm not going to apologize about the complexities of my human experience. And so therefore I can't apologize for the complexity of what grief looks like, um, especially when I've, I've experienced the worst nightmare of any parent, you know, uh, and so I just... You know, I, I give myself grace, I give myself space, and I give myself permission. You said that Christian's passing changed the mission of equity. How did how did it change? What is how did it change it? What is that new mission? Yeah, I I think I wouldn't necessarily say it changed it. I think it evolved it, right? Mm -hmm. It helped it evolve, right? Yeah. The mission of equity has always been geared toward making wellness accessible right as as someone who's you know from 12 13 years ago one of the only black guys that i knew that did yoga and practiced meditation and all of these things right like oh. you know, there there were always these you know these this group of gatekeepers and so the the mission was always to make better for you quality products more accessible and equitable to more people i think that it evolved to now include um, you know, teenagers at risk, right? You know, yeah. And like when we look at when we look at what our children are up against right now, we as parents cannot fathom the full extent of it. We think we can, right? Oh, we've been through things, we've experienced this, we've experienced that. Yeah, but we never grew up finding our own validation in the phone. Right. We've never grown up with people DMing us, telling us to harm ourselves or what beauty looks like. Our beauty standards were based on Sports Illustrated magazines and Playboy. Yeah. Oh, you know, and, and what we saw in movies and TV, you know, but like Laura Winslow was beautiful to me as a kid growing up, as was Lisa Bonet, you know, and, yeah. you know, the Cosby show in a different world. Right. So, we, yeah. Our beauty, the, the standards by which we saw beauty and by which we judged in, in ourselves was completely different. It didn't come from people pretending to be other people, you know. Uh, yeah. it, it, so, so we have to evolve the conversation around what being well looks like, what it means to be well, 
how we find wellness and not just for us as millennials or you know who, who, you know or older adults but also for the individuals that are coming behind us right like we have to evolve this idea and this concept and i think you know uh it, my son's unfortunate passing helped me to realize that there mm. were things that i thought i knew that i really didn't and and i think not blaming myself in what in, in any capacity any more than i've already but i think if if i would have humbled myself a bit more in recognizing that that I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not to say that he would still be here, but it's to say that I may have operated differently. You know, I knew I knew we were going to have this conversation and I was looking for some kind of message or word, you know, and uh, I just did an interview with this woman named Marsha Ann Donaldson, who was on the show last season and touched a lot of people, particularly women who've been in really bad relationships and really bad headspaces, talk about images of beauty and how society treats women. It's, it's terrible, especially Black women. Um, she said, as she said in that conversation, she says that we, we have to move through life identifying the lessons and the blessings. That's how we gain clarity. Then she went on to say that we are mosaic tiles that get chipped and broken on purpose and for a purpose that it liberates our soul. Do you, that gave me some kind of peace. Mm. And I wonder what is your perspective on that in terms of the chips and the brokenness is for a purpose? Yeah, I, I agree a thousand percent. I think it was beautifully stated and eloquently put we often look at the things that happen whether to us or around us and 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 there's victimization attached to it you know and i've gotten to a point in my life where i realize that my time on this planet is very limited right and also my time on this planet in my belief it's not the completion of my time in the universe, right? I believe that we are spiritual beings having a human experience, right? And so, yeah, I think that there is a greater intention for the the brokenness, for the chips. Um, and I think it all happens for a greater purpose. And, and that purpose may be something that we don't, we don't, understand or we may never achieve in this human form right but it doesn't mean that it's happening to us as much as it's happening for us right and so if i didn't believe in that idea there'd be no reason for me to continue moving forward mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, you know, I tried to take my life multiple occasions, you know, before any of this took place. Yeah. You know, and so a part of that healing process from then up until now has been the, the recognizing and understanding of, of exactly what was stated and what was put. Yeah. Right. Um, I think we can also be those one, you know, be the individuals doing the chipping. Oh, yeah. And not knowing it, right? Our trauma and how we act and behave as a result of our trauma can also be chipping away, you know? Uh, and, and so I think there's, I think there's nuance and complexity to all of it. Yeah. And, but it also provides a unique opportunity for us to learn who we truly are, what we're capable of, and more importantly, what our purpose is. And I think our purpose is never one dimensional. I think that changes as we do. Yeah. I I was I was just doing some re some research on fentanyl and I think it was right around the time we had set the time to do this we we were, we were going to talk and literally in my news feed it popped up that eBay just paid out a significant penalty for not following the Controlled Substances Act and then I, and I, and I was like, this is, this is serendipitous. 
Um, and I'm going to read what the Department of Justice said. So that eBay has agreed to pay $59 million and to enhance its compliance program to resolve allegations that it violated the Controlled Substances Act in connection with thousands of pill presses and encapsulating machines that were sold through its website. Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta, chair of the Justice Department's Opioid Epidemic Civil Litigation Task Force, said, counterfeit pills laced with fentanyl are a significant contribution to the deadly overdose epidemic. The department is committed to using all available enforcement measures to ensure that companies involved in selling the equipment that makes it possible to create these dangerous pills comply with the Controlled Substances Act. And I, I wonder what is your perspective on that? You know, um, You know, I, I think I think a lot of it, you know, and, and maybe I sound pessimistic, but I think a lot of it is a, is is a box check, right? Like fifty nine million dollars can't it can't bring back a life, it can't change, you know. Um, what we all are are struggling with and, and and suffering through right and so yeah great they paid out 59 million dollars in a lawsuit to whom i don't even know yeah like okay cool but that doesn't that doesn't bring back my son right that doesn't change the reality that you know a person dies from a fentanyl overdose every day yeah Right. eBay is only one drop in the bucket of, of where people have access. You know, um, there are other parties that need to be held accountable. Uh, and I think eBay is 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 just. One fall guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't it doesn't change. The, the only reason why it's being looked at as an epidemic in the first place is because it's more than black people that's being impacted by it. Um, right and so you know um like let's just call a spade a spade yeah you know uh because if it was just something that was rampant in our communities like the crack epidemic or like the heroin epidemic of the eight, the 70s 80s and 90s right it would be a completely different story and so knowing and understanding that it's just a drop in the bucket it's a nice box check it's something that can help some people go to sleep at night uh, while others can't grieve. Right. And so, you know, uh, we still have to live every day. Uh -huh. uh, we still have to experience this and, and, and grieve through it and grow from it and, 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 and feel the pain, um, you know, of some corporations um, neglect. Uh -huh. Uh, it doesn't mean anything to me. You know, this this season on the show, I was kind of on the fence about doing another season of the show, but then I really got interested in this idea, kind of to what you said, this idea of that we're only on this earth for however many years that we're here, but we all leave some kind of legacy behind. We all leave something that is there, that is a, that is a remembrance of who we are or, or, and what we did or what we didn't do. The chips that we got and the chips that we gave when I think about it like that. And I wonder for you, what do you think your legacy is or will be? Yeah, that's an interesting question, right? I've, you know, I think I think my legacy is is still being written. Mm -hmm. You know, um if if I were to, you know, if anything, God forbid, were to happen, you know, I think. I would be best know, I would be known for being honest, caring about people and humanity, and yeah. wanting to leave the world a little bit better than it was when I came into it. That has has always been the most prevalent foundation for everything that I've done. 
I've walked away from opportunities because they question my integrity and my beliefs. I've walked away from a lot of money because I was unwilling to compromise my integrity and what I believed. I, I, I firmly live by the saying that I would rather die on my feet than live on my knees. Mm -hmm. And I am a living embodiment of that belief. And I am unapologetic about it and, and I don't compromise it under any circumstances. And so to know me is to love me. Mm -hmm. um, but to do bad by me is to never forget me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Quentin. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time and your, always the conversation in your heart. And, you know, I think about it, I think about your son a lot. Thank you. And that journey that he was on and that you were on. And that you continue to be on. I just I just pray for your peace and for your family. You know, I really do. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Above and beyond this conversation, just I appreciate you. I appreciate you back, my friend. All right, to those of you who are watching or listening, remember we all have a voice. We all will leave a legacy. Live and choose wisely. Bye, everyone. <laughs>